Hey, today is October 16th, 2017, and we survived HFES! You are listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 62, and uh, we're going to be breaking down VR for fun in and in healthcare, and uh, we're going to be uh, connecting cochlear implants into your smartphone. We'll see how that goes, and we'll take a look at what robots are doing in your gut. I have nothing clever to say. HFES has drained me, but uh, it starts right now. Let's do it! Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf over there, who can't hear the music. Hey, what's up guys? It's good to be back here on a Monday. Nick, how are you doing, man? Oh man, okay, I'm good. I'm really exhausted after the whole HFES thing, uh, but man, am I good. Uh, I gotta say, so last week, I mentioned briefly during one of our... Uh, one of our episodes, one of our bonus episodes, which thank you all for the positive feedback on those. We received a couple of things and, and special shout out to Noah, who is in our Slack channel, uh, who said, I thoroughly enjoyed the bonus, especially the one with the guest and his detailed account of the Toyota plant. Um, so thank you all for the positive feedback on those. We'll try to do those whenever we can, whenever we have some sort of conference coming up that relates to human factor psychology. And uh, yeah, we'll try to we'll try to get more of those unique perspectives on the show. But during one of those episodes, I mentioned that there was something that I thought was banter worthy, and it happened on the Wednesday right before I went on to uh, t- to chair the session. And this Star Wars hyper reality experience trailer dropped, and it's called Secrets of the Empire. Have you seen this thing? No, what's what's going on here? Oh man. So okay. So it is basically like my dream. So <laughs> they have this facility in downtown Disney and in Orlando as well. I'm not sure where in Orlando, but the the idea here is that they have this actual physical facility that um has uh, you know, it's a it's a big concrete wall area and uh, it maps onto the walls the um uh, th- th- those uh, visual identifiers so that way when you put on the virtual reality headset you can actually interact with things like switches and buttons on the wall and uh, you can actually see yourself in the virtual environment you dress up as a stormtrooper so you see you know you're undercover as a stormtrooper and you're holding a blaster and you get to shoot imperials and there's uh you're, you're on mustafar so it's the the lava planet and so there's heat and and music and everything and it, it looks really fun and i'm really excited about it yeah, that sounds right up your alley, man. That's pretty cool. So this is in both California and Florida, right? Correct, yeah. I'm unsure where it is in Florida, but I do know that it is downtown Disney in uh, California. Gotcha. When you go, man, you'll have to like come back to the show and break it down for us, because that sounds like a pretty sweet experience, and especially since it's like live in a specific place. So that's cool. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. I uh, I have the date picked out. You have to pick a day and time and... I did it on my birthday because happy birthday to me. Very cool. How about you, man? What's going on with you? Oh, man. So <laughs> I had a pretty lazy weekend. I won't lie. After all those HFES bonus episode shows, I, don't blame I was you. a little tired myself. Um, so I actually kind of gave myself a gift and bought the last installment of the Zombies for Infinite Warfare this weekend. And it was just I haven't played Call of Duty or zombie games in a long time it's been like i don't know almost six months and it was just really interesting to me how much the user experience has changed both on the xbox's just general operating system and through the games themselves so i mean it was it was kind of mind-blowing that like for each one of these games there's like a there's a group of people that like to do the easter egg parts to them so not so much going around for round but actually like going through and doing some of the little weird things the developers have stuck in there well, Xbox has integrated a feature that allows you to actually post to all Xbox Live players across the world and gather teammates to do that with you. Um, so there's a, like a social feature I'd never heard of, um, but ended up meeting a lot of cool people over the weekend <laughs> through Xbox. So it was a cool experience, as always, a good story, very hard, 
way too many hours spent playing it, but it was a lot of fun. Well, that's I'm glad you had fun because you deserved it. I, I want to shout out to Mr. Blake Arnsdorf for last week. He was the real MVP holding the show together. I literally had just my phone over there in Austin, and uh, Blake was holding down the fort here in California, and he was uh, producing and mixing and doing everything with the show and putting it up on, on our services and everything. So so big shout out to you, Blake. That was that was really awesome of you to do that for us. Oh, for sure. I'm happy to do it anytime. And it was fun that you could actually be at a live event and we could really break it down and that you had guests and everything. So it was a good time for everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I said, I think I think uh, if opportunities present themselves later on for other conferences, I think I think it's a good thing to do. So I wanted to talk briefly. Uh, we mentioned on the show that we may try to plug some events that are going on on around town or not around town like other conferences or whatnot um and i just going off of that hfes train there is going to be in a san diego chapter hfes social uh this friday october 20th at 3 p.m this is going to be in cutwater spirits in san diego um and if you need an address to that, uh, either Google it or join the Slack, and I can send that to you. Uh, we'll be providing light appetizers, or, or SDHFES will be. But uh, yeah, please uh, please feel free to come by, say hi, and uh, network with us. And I see that you have one of these as well, Blake. Yeah, actually, I do have an event to plug this week. So the San Diego experience design group is actually throwing a dark ux workshop on this wednesday downtown and i'll be sure to tweet more um more details about it because that's all i really have i think it's from six to about nine o'clock this evening uh but again it's uh the sdxd or san diego experience design group throwing a dark ux workshop it's a great opportunity to learn a bit a bit about dark patterns in ux and how they contrast with just maybe the light side of things as well as network learn how to work in little small teams should be a fun event so wednesday night if you got nothing to do in san diego be sure to check it out like i said i'll make sure to tweet about all the details to get them out to everybody that sounds like uh it was intentionally planned for the halloween season you know i think you're right that sounds like a really <laughs> good thing to do <laughs> well that's great all right well uh Hopefully, hopefully, some of our listeners show up. I, I loved interacting with you guys at uh, HFES. That was, it was always, it's always humbling to know that we have people that listen to the show on a weekly basis. But uh, anyway, let's should we hit that news? Let's <laughs> let's get that news. All right. So this is this is the part of the show all about human factors news. This is going to be anything from medical, transportation, psychology, whatever it is, as long as it has to do with the field of human factors. It's fair game, and I have to put up a fair warning. Uh, I have not read these stories because I was out and about last week, so my commentary may be lacking just a bit. But Blake, what do we got up first this week? All right. First this week, we got some California news. So California's DNV, the home from Nick and myself, has changed its rules to allow completely driverless cars to operate in the state. Although as a state... As a state, we will have to wait on federal rules, but this is a big step for California. So California is already one of the more accommodating states to sell driving cars amongst the rest of the states in the country, and the modified regulations actually streamline testing and the use of driverless cars. However, the DMV is quite adamant that it's not trying to override federal efforts to regulate self-driving cars, and California will, of course, have to require a certification for all federal standards before their rides are legal. But Nick, this is a great step, as we've seen in a lot of legislature, but specifically for the state that we live in, for getting self-driving cars not really necessarily in the, like, this is a bad kind of analogy, quote-unquote, in their hands uh, of actual people, but at least testing them out on our roads. Yeah, it, there's a huge barrier to entry if you can't test something on the roads. And, uh, you know, we've seen sort of this evolution of legislature around self-driving cars over the last couple months and it's always it's always cool to see how it sort of evolves and um changes not only at the federal level but also at the uh, state level and it, it'll also be interesting to see how other countries um tend to sort of approach this problem as well right and that's not something that we've really covered on the show but it's something that i'm always kind of on the lookout for I don't know. I, I, I like where we're going with all this. Yeah, and it's it's kind of interesting to me because it all seems to f 
get around this one central theme, right, of making it just easier to test in the state and get them on the actual road. And so just to give our listeners some context in case they haven't been able to read the article, the general tweak that the DMV has made, and this is this is verbatim. So car makers no longer have to notify their local officials of the operational design domain of their machines. So summarizing all the instances of when a car's autonomous driving engages or certified that a car can't drive itself in commonly restricted conditions, which is a little bit strange to me that they don't have to do that. I mean, I'm assuming that at some point they're having to deliver these kind of details about how the actual autonomous driving is working on the roads. Um, but maybe not every time they launch an instance of the car. And I'm assuming that's why this is such a big tweak and s- stops kind of like that slowing down or prevents be- or is a barrier to getting cars on the road. So help me break down this, this statement here. So this is basically saying that they don't have to report anymore like, uh, like you would for a method section of an of a experiment, right? They, they no longer have to report, we're going to disengage at this time, um, and these are the the drawbacks it's it's like they they no longer have to propose to the irb they're good we we understand that autonomous vehicles can work and just go do your thing and then come back with your reports is that kind of what i'm understanding here that's what it seems like to me i really like your analogy to taking out the method section of your paper um but you, you know it's it's kind of a strange tweak to me because it, as exciting as all this kind of moving forward is this particular instance, although it's making it easier to get these cars out and about, I'm not sure that they should be not requiring them to at least like submit this. Maybe not go through necessarily a pr- approval process if nothing major has changed in how the machine or system works. But still, I feel like understanding the operational design, I would think that there would need to be people on whatever local committee that has to deal with these kinds of matters would need to understand what's going on because if you uh, the part that we, I guess we don't like to really think about is I mean eventually these things just by laws of statistics right you're gonna have accidents yeah, you're gonna and get through gonna the trolley be, problem yeah exactly and there's gonna be the the whole stretch of time where it's a, this integration of autonomous cars with human driven cars and getting through that how's it going to work and then where's the where's the legal gray area of who's at fault is it the car maker the algorithm maker all that kind of stuff so i'm as as good as this is for california and as for self-driving car testing i'm very skeptical about this particular measure they've taken of taking like taking the technology piece out of it or having to notify people about it i don't know nick what do you think about it i don't know man i so on one hand I think I think either way is too extreme, right? If you have government's hands on everything and they're like, okay, what are you doing? When are you doing it? When are you going to be doing... Yeah, when are you doing it? And then uh, you have how are you doing it, all that stuff. It takes a lot of time to prepare a document like that and to go through a review process and... But, but on the other side, you know, people are, are free to do whatever they like then there's, yeah, there's, like, what if during one of the tests the autonomous vehicle comes across the trolley problem? Like, well, then someone should have reviewed that beforehand. So I think it's, I think, personally, I think it should be a healthy mix between the two, but it's it's interesting to see that, you know, there there is sort of this, this uh, attitude, at least in California, to say, Nope. All right. You go, you go ahead and figure this out. And, and, uh, you know, you do you basically. Yeah. And I, I hate to sound like a a semi conspiracy theorist or whatever, but I think that a lot of that might have to do with probably two things. Uh, one, the, a lot of the tech is here. Like a lot of the bigger companies that are really diving into the space, Google, Tesla, uh, Lyft, all, yeah, all of those guys located here. I'm sure that has some kind of sway. But like money things aside, I think I may have uh, may understand why this is the way it is. And it's because I kind of forgot a pivotal part of the article. Uh-oh. Like, this is only the this is from a local perspective, right? 
So they're and what they're what the DMV ah, has made right. like clear is that all those regulations, probably what we're talking about, trolley problems, submitting this kind of information, has to probably be covered at the federal level. So yep. now once we get get them in the state, now they're like, Okay, you've already gone through the wickets. We understand that you've passed all of the federal regulations. Let's get you testing in our actual state so we can utilize this tech. Um, so I'm assuming that's maybe where this is coming from. Yeah, you know what? You just gave me a lot of peace of mind with that comment, and I think that's exactly where we're at with that. So good job. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> oh, All man. right. Let's get into Oculus Go. I want to talk about this. All right, cool. All right, so last week, Oculus released the Oculus Go, and it's the equivalent to the Gear VR or the Daydream, but there came many complaints from VR, VR enthusiasts once it was released. So the Go offers the world another headset that's been stripped down of everything that makes VR so promising. It's not an attention-grabbing, certainly isn't really that sexy, and it doesn't offer anything that others don't, at least not experience-wise. So what's the deal with this release? Well, Oculus's goal was to provide a headset that simplifies the VR experience and makes it more approachable to the middle ground of consumers. And I think they've done just that with this particular product. And so this was kind of... and. One thing that I didn't mention in the top here, they had actually improved a little bit upon at least the Gear VR, the Daydream, and they've they've removed the need for you to put your smartphone into the device or into the headset. So now it's just a slap it on and you can go experience some kind of VR thing. But Nick, I was really looking for your opinions here because this seems like Oculus is, they're one of the, I think, one of the higher ranked kind of headsets right now now they've taken a step down what does this how does this make you feel or what do you think about it no opinion next story i'm just kidding uh so (laughs) this is uh this is interesting right because what they found or, or what this signals to me is that there's we are not at the point right now where we have powerful enough devices to run this stuff at home in a very controlled environment with all the cords and cables and that's not where virtual reality is right now maybe someday sure as tools uh you have these very powerful machines but what they're trying to tap into this consumer market where people are curious about vr uh the same market that the google daydream and uh the samsung uh gear vr that they're trying to tap into that same market and i think it's wise because they do something here that they that either of these other ones don't they do um so so they don't you don't put your phone in this and use that you are using a screen that's built in and uh you know the difference here is that you don't have that whole set it up put it in and then once you're in to change modes you have to unclip the VR thing and, and uh, pull it out and, and set it up again. And they, they, some of these companies have streamlined this a little bit. So like, I know the daydream has uh, an application where you can actually browse other VR apps within the thing. So you never have to leave the headset. But the, the problem is that you are compromising your phone in this process, right? You are using your phone. It is. And, and the VR is only as good as your phone. Um, but at least to my understanding, this Oculus Go is trying to address the, uh, here's, here's a display that's fairly mm, standardized across all of our devices because, you know, there's no, uh, that you don't put in your own phone. And, uh, also, I don't know. I, I honestly, I'm at a loss as to what else to say about this because it's, I can see, merit to it i just can't see the application yet yeah and i think that's the whole point really right because this this article kind of takes a little bit of a a darker look at this like uh it's not really that much i mean it's cool and they're doing a good thing but it's it's a lot of it's a negative connotation except for when it's talking about basically the business model they've adapted which to me signals that they're paying attention to the space and that i hope other companies are doing the same and are gonna mimic these kind of practices because these higher end headsets are awesome and people that can afford them or people that are enthusiasts in the VR space know that they know the benefits they know what they can get out of them whether it's gamers people using them in training paradigms you can 
there's a long list, but this kind of stuff is really what's going to allow VR to take off in the every man's world. Like you can, you can hop in, you don't have to use your phone. You just put this thing on your face and you go. And I feel like as long as they continue to at least like give it, um, enjoyable content, I mean, you don't have to go full bore on Oculus go, but things like this at a lower price point that allow a lot of people to get into it is a very smart plan on their end. Cause I mean, originally what they had done is kind of gone to the higher end models, uh, versus like what they talk about in the article. You, in, in Apple's history, what they've done is really try and aim products at the mid range. And then once those are successful, then you really step into like pro tiers of max book, Mac books, or in this case, pro tiers of headsets. So I, I, I don't know, maybe some listeners are questioning why this is in here. I think this just really shows some good research in their user base and understanding who they're targeting right now based on the products they have and how to improve that and change it if they really want VR to take off in the space. Yeah, I also think it's important to th- this is human factors related because it it, it does kind of get at that you know, who who is the target demographic for this like you were saying, but it, it it's deeper than that. It's like this this is at the consumer level now and they're trying to make it affordable and um you know, proliferate through the consumer market rather than just a specialized uh, subset of people who are interested in VR like myself. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, I think that's the, I think what you'll see too is right now, it, I I don't really know. I'm not as much in the VR space, but I feel like it's, it's good, but this kind of interaction and push for to have it in more people's homes, kind of like we have these interactive voice tools that are all of a sudden popping up in people's homes more often. Um, it'll, push the space it'll push innovation in different directions potentially in like in ones that they're not even prepared for like maybe people start using it to grocery shop online i don't know something something like that but something it, it i don't know the the cool thing about oculus is i feel like they're really pushing it in terms of expanding what vr is and bringing it into the forefront of kind of the consumer base yeah i agree i agree it'll be interesting to see where it goes uh, all right, so before we move on to our next uh, story, I just want to thank all of our friends over at the Next Web and Gadget, IEEE, Spectrum, for all of our news stories this week. <clears throat> if you want to follow along uh, with these articles, you can uh, follow us all over social media, and we post those as we find them. So, uh, you know, that's that's the best way to stay up to date. We also post them in our Slack, too, so you can come over there and comment on them and if we like what you have to say about it, we can pull that comment into the show, too. All right, so, Blake, what do we got up next? Let's keep on with this VR theme. Yeah, we're still in the VR land. So virtual reality, as we kind of know, might get its popularity from applications that we're pretty much aware of, such as film, gaming, gaming, and even maybe the adult entertainment industry. But Ooh. it's quickly becoming one of the most powerful new developments in a completely different field, and that's healthcare. So, in fact, virtual and augmented reality are making giant leaps in three specific areas of healthcare: that of surgery, medical training, and patient treatment. And Nick, I kind of wanted just to break down, and we don't have to do like deep in-depth analysis here, but just break down each one of the sections, kind of what the articles talk about with relation to the application of, I guess, virtual and augmented reality. Sure. Well, I've been uh, training to be a surgeon for a very long time in a little game called Surgeon Simulator. <laughs> you know, that it's it, those games are really funny, but I think that's how this stuff really gets started. I think that games often, I don't know, people laugh at them, but at some point it's like, wait, maybe we could actually use some of this tech and make people... I don't know, more aware of how to be a surgeon or make our surgeons better. And I think that's just what some of these companies have done that are mentioned in the article. Um, So one one element like Nick is talking about is they use VR for surgery. Actually, I've never heard of this, Nick. They call it XR because it's a mix of augmented reality with virtual reality. Had you heard of that term before? I've heard mixed reality. um, And that that would make sense for XR. So, yeah, I mean... uh, let me look it up really quick because I don't want to sound like an idiot. <laughs> oh, man. Well, basically, the idea here, too, is that they're bringing medical field data that surgeons can use to prepare and plan for the actual operations they're going to have. So they bring in models of 
MRI, CAT scans, ultrasounds, whatever data that the surgeons can pull in, and they actually use that as a VR simulation for surgery they're going to perform. Um, there's even some quotes from the article that say that when a, sur when a surgeon said that when he gets into the operation room, it's nice because he's seen this before, so he knows kind of the space that he's operating in. Let's say if this is kind of um, a cancer surgeon, he's seen the tumor, he knows what the insides of this person look like based off of the kind of model data and can, you know, act accordingly and maybe even improve some of his surgical procedures because he's already been there and had practice with it. Sure, um, yeah. And, I mean, we've seen simulator training before. We see this all the time with uh, airplane pilots. I mean, they, they go in for training in these simulators and the only difference is that their cockpit is their headset, really. So I I think this is just a natural progression. Like as we start to tackle some of these more complex problems that have a variety of tools that you need to use to accomplish it, or if it's uh, different settings is what I'm trying to get at here. There's different settings that you can do this in. And so it, 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 to me, it's a natural progression of using virtual reality to put yourself in a non-threatening environment that is going to help you practice to do the real thing, especially when the stakes are so high in a situation like this. Yeah, and it's one of those situations where I don't know if the stakes can get higher. And of course, we've got very proficient surgeons or else they just couldn't do what they do. But what I thought it was awesome that there was a, a preparation application of VR for surgery, but also that during the surgery, they actually incorporate AR to help onlay specific areas if they're for the surgery in case they like need it. So if they need to be aware of like a certain area, they can actually you know, onlay the way that the surgery is supposed to go or using kind of maps out for that. So I thought that was a really interesting application of both um, in right. kind of the same context. Yeah, so so to me, uh, the XR that we talked about earlier briefly sounds more like mixed reality. And honestly, I can't parse the two. I don't know what, what you know, extended reality versus mixed reality. And, and maybe one of our uh, more versed listeners can inform us. But the the, the thing to me is that it's basically, yeah, it's using both virtual elements and reality to help the operator do their job. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, it's definitely increasing their, I don't, I don't know, this this one kind of bleeds into the medical training aspect too, because that's basically what they're doing is they're training themselves to prepare for surgery, to do it however many times they would like to bef beforehand or make preparations about what they're going to do. Um, and then... Hopefully, and I think it's been proven that over time, especially being immersed in like a, a more intensive uh, training set with regard to surgery, I mean, it improves their errors, their performance of the procedure, how quickly they're able to do it. And even there's been some, I'm assuming there's been some reported improvements in patient outcomes even because they've done this before in multiple contexts. Oh, yeah. And I mean, some of that's probably placebo, too, like just knowing that the doctor is more experienced in their specific case. I don't know. That would be an interesting study to look at, I think. Yeah, most definitely. It, it would be interesting because I know that a couple of our colleagues have done some work with robotic surgery, and I feel like this this is this VR application, especially maybe even AR, the AR part uh, for like remote surgeries may even be a cool application of these kind of tools. Um, but kind of the last, last place that we're seeing VR in the... Uh, Medical field is with patient treatment. Um, so this specific company that's mentioned is called Common Ground VR, which actually helps people with visual abilities like glaucoma. Um, all, basically, by playing the specific game that they're given to play on a VR headset, uh, it can help them increase their empathy, but also determine what assistance and treatments are needed. So it kind of helps as almost a diagnostic tool for if somebody's having mental issues or if they or having different kinds of visual disabilities that can help diagnose, like, okay, what can we do to maybe strengthen parts of the eyes, blah, blah, blah. Um, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. This, th All this VR stuff in healthcare, I think, is, I think this is really where the future of it lies. I mean, of course, it's going to be in gaming and entertainment, but I think these applications for patient treatment, especially this last one where it's basically talking about using VR to help 
either Parkinson's patients or amputees kind of yeah. using using this kind of tech to help them help their brain stimulate limb movements or help them with memory things when it comes to Parkinson's as well. Um, I don't know. This this kind of stuff really makes me hopeful for where the future is going with, with the integration of so much technology into our human lives. Yeah, what is the... Uh... Oh, what is the 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 condition where amputees uh, feel like their fists are clinching? Um, I don't. Is it phantom limb syndrome? I think so. I think that's it. That sounds right. Uh, I know that VR has been used to treat phantom limb syndrome before, and uh, it's just taking that and, and and phobias as well. It's it's interesting to see how many different applications VR can do for the medical field and, and for therapy. And, and yeah, I'm very excited to see what other applications we can dream up to sort of use uh, in addition to those other ones or alongside yeah, those other I, ones. And I, just to, like, I guess, tie back to Oculus Go, I feel like with the advent of, you know, cheaper virtual reality headsets, I mean, if the integration into different hospitals or more hospitals... Um, the cost could be low to them. Now, this is all probably going to depend on the software they run, and that's probably where the expense is really coming in. It depends. That's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, okay. Well, I, I I have nothing else to say on this other than cool, good, good to get that status update, and uh, excited to see what other things are coming out of it. But, uh, man, that, that mixed reality was pretty cool, I think. I That's something that I didn't necessarily think of. But, and, yeah, that's an awesome application, right? Yeah, and also you bring up a really great point of bringing this into homes. If you can bring home treatment to the masses instead of having to go to a very specialized area in a hospital to even feel some relief, like that that's a huge that's a huge thing. Oh, yeah, I mean that's a that is a pretty great point there, Nick. I mean, if you're able to kind of, you know, with physical therapy, they give you exercises, you go home and you keep practicing. Maybe that's kind of a, a similar analogy here. You'd be able to like take a VR headset home and, you know, practice anything with whether it's like related to the phantom limb stuff like we were talking about earlier or maybe even uh, helping with cognitive capabilities by playing specific games. Uh, who knows? Yeah, sure. All right. So this next story, I have to admit, I am super interested in. And uh, I want you to break it down for me. Yeah. Okay. So this one is a little near and dear to my heart. But anyway, so Cochlear, a company that makes cochlear implants, of course, and Apple recently unveiled hearing implants that could be connected to an iPhone. So those who suffer hearing loss have had the surgical option for years, of course. But this is the first time that we've been able to connect their nervous system directly to a smartphone. Now, those with a cochlear implant will be able to use their phones and a specific smart app that will allow them to listen to phone calls, YouTube, Netflix, and any other audio playable content via their iPhone. Now, this is really an interesting partnership between two companies. Um, and it's I like it because it's, it's tailored for people with a specific disability here, in this case, loss of hearing. Um, <laughs> Uh, honestly, though, I felt like I was a little misled by the title because it's talking about connecting your iPhone to your nervous system. I didn't really yeah. realize that it was specifically talking about only people with cochlear implants. But nonetheless, being able to transmit information basically to to your nervous system from your phone just sounds incredible. Now, I have to ask about the resolution of this audio. I mean... You, there's always noise. There's always noise, whether or not you have in headphones or earbuds or just listening to something out in the wild. There is always noise. There is always some sort of gain. Now, I'm wondering if you plug in directly to your cochlear implant, is that the most pure audio you can ever have? You know, you're probably right, Nick. And I mentioned before, this is kind of near and dear to me. My stepdad actually has a large amount of hearing loss. And these like a different applications that have come out for your smartphone that connect with, in his case, hearing aids have really been a game changer in some instances. But still, you're right. 
even with a cochlear implant, you're having to deal with extraneous noise in different places. And that makes it so hard for people to actually, you know, get utility out of these different implants or hearing aids, even with companion apps. So that was something I actually wondered myself as well. I mean, would you get a better sound resolution if this was plugging in through your like lightning port? Um, versus trying to transmit wirelessly from an app to your implant. I'm not really sure how that part of it works, but I would definitely agree with you or along the same lines that if you're plugged directly in, you're going to get like amazing sound quality versus trying to do something wirelessly because then you're dealing with more noise to potentially your cochlear implants picking that up as well, that kind of stuff. Well, let me ask you, so I'm, I'm unfamiliar with the domain. Uh, so you said your stepdad, right? Is, yeah. So cochlear implants are designed in order to help those with hearing loss uh, hear the real world, right? Yeah, definitely. Okay. And they're the, you, you describe some of these apps that kind of wirelessly communicate to the cochlear implant. Uh, so the one I'm specifically talking about is more related to hearing aids that I've seen. Oh, okay seen being used so that's more of just doing based on your location you can make kind of kind of how you would with the soundboard right like think of your sound think of a soundboard on your phone for ambient noise so you can alter kind of where sounds coming in if it's too loud from the right if you need more on the left those kind of small tweaks you can make but those are yeah those are for hearing aids not the cochlear implants correct yes correct okay this this i'm unsure of even how it works besides having this specific app talking with this co- this specific cochlear made by cochlear um, because they talk about in the article that this specific implant has this nucleus processing chip that actually integrates with this apple app right so, so that's how it's actually communicated so i'm wondering uh, this is just so fascinating to me because the way cochlear implants work is it basically stimulates the cochlea in ways that it, it transduces the audio signals that it's getting from the real world, transduces those signals into electrical signals, and stimulates the cochlea um, so that way the person can hear. Now, I'm wondering with this app, if if does it override anything that comes from the environment and just produces the things that are the music that's coming from this app? Um, does it you know is it like the ultimate noise canceling headphones like that is what i want to know you, you know nick you might be on to something cuz if i'm trying to think like if you're if you're if it's interpreting signals and this is specifically for things that you're i guess channeling through this smart app whether it's phone calls or netflix it would just be that sound maybe only being communicated to your brain or or uh, in this case, stimulating your the cochlea in in your ear. So I don't know, but it I think you'd have to be right because how would it? I, I don't know how it would deal with that many different levels of sound. Yeah. So here's what we do: we do a test with your stepdad and get him to report back and let us know if it is the most amazing sound that he's ever heard in his life. <laughs> yeah, man, I w- I that would be great because I know that even with companion apps and different things that have tried to improve hearing aids over the years, like he just for the the money you end up spending on them, they're just not worth it. So I've always wondered if implants like this, how they would benefit somebody like him. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm excited for this because if it, um, yeah, I I'm I'm so excited for the people who have these things because. There is nothing more magical than listening to noise canceling audio, at least in my opinion. And if you can get the most pure out of it, then that's that's even better. No, I totally agree with you on the noise canceling audio. I feel like I work the best when I have like kind of an immersion in sound uh, of my choosing. Kind of, I don't know. It feels like you get into a flow state or a kind of a zone. So. I don't know. I'd love to actually talk to somebody with these kind of implants to get their take on it for just how it how it changes their perceptions like just with the implant itself but now being in, able to interact with their smartphone. Yeah. All right, let's get into this last story of the week. Oh my goodness. Okay, so I saved a little bit of weekly weird for the last one this time. Not so much a fun one, but a strange one. So there's a flexible sensor that's been developed at MIT in 
conjunction with Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston that can monitor the movements in the stomach, sense indigestion, and power itself for at least two days without degrading. The device can be used to record how frequently a person is eating and help monitor various gut disorders. So the study's author, Giovanni Traverso, a gastroenterologist and biomedical engineer, weighed in on the applications of a device like this, stating that understanding gut movement helps us as healthcare providers to potentially intervene to really help patients. So as for now, the device is just a proof of concept, but in the future, doctors could use it for patients with different gut disorders. This seemed so out of the realm of sci-fi to me that you can actually now ingest something and it's measuring data about your body and can base not it's not necessarily living but it can survive within your gut system for days at a time yeah yeah uh yeah i so i i'm reading the comment on the actual article that we pulled uh and I, I know this is not very human factors y, but it is something that I'm curious about, and I, I would suspect that you're curious about too, Blake. Um, this person says, it would be very interesting to see how the digestion is affected with certain combinations of food. Uh, there is enormous potential in understanding nutrition with this technology. Oh, for sure. And I think a lot of the reasons that I pulled this one specifically, and it may be that I'm much more niche than some of our listeners for sure, but I'm very interested in how the gut affects your health. And I know that a lot of science has been built up around pre and probiotics, really understanding how, how those, those additions to your diet can improve your overall health, not just in terms of your gut itself, but how your neurochemistry works. Um, even like how your how the rest of your blood cells interact with each other and are able to attack disease. So inter this introduction of technology like this is really going to further that line of healthcare and providing more personalized medicine. Um, so that was really where I was coming from, but I definitely agree with that comment. I mean, really getting an insight into people's micro gut biome as well as what the nutrients in their system are like based off what they eat can again, help you provide a more personalized nutrition program for them to get the best out of themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm all about that whole monitoring thing, right? And if we could just pop pills every couple of days and have it monitor our gut and to have it alert us when something's not going right, uh, that would help at least our understanding of our bodies tremendously. Cause then we can go, Oh, something's not right. Uh, I ate something that is causing problems and a, I won't eat that again. And maybe I need to go see a doctor. Yeah, and even to take it a step further, think about if your doctor is now, since we're talking about like a Fitbit for the stomach, but what if you're able to use your Fitbit data in uh, congruence with this kind of gut data, right? Do you, are you seeing any kind of changes in your your heart monitoring based off of things that you're eating? or your la Is your lack of exercise being affected by things you're eating or maybe go what's going on in your gut? There could be a lot of different ways we can draw conclusions about people's health or their habits based on the more data we have for sure yeah i'm all about that i'm all about that i was about that with the cars taking your fitbit data and well your biometric data and uh, i'm about it with this uh, uh, more data the better because then you can you can get a better sense of what's going on with your body uh should we see well, what what came from reddit this week let's do it man all right so this is the it came from reddit section this is a uh, our our outreach section of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you guys topics the community's talking about. So any subreddits fair game, as long as it relates to human factors and encourages discussion among you guys. So our first question today comes from the user experience subreddit. How do I become a UX UI designer when I can't draw slash sketch slash paint for shit? And that is by pixel rage nine. Um, he goes on to say, hi guys. A uh, programmer here that doesn't mind getting my hands dirty with Java or HTML, but how the hell do I become a UX UI designer if I'm not artistic enough? Now, don't get me wrong. I have a very good eye for design, and I usually create some stunning packages and logos, uh, but that's only possible with me giving creative direction to a graphics designer. I have this really cool look for an app screen that I want to create, but where do I even begin? Sad face. Blake, I'll let you take this one. <laughs> <laughs> Sad face. Oh, man. Sad well, face. Pixel Rage 9... Worry not if you cannot paint, draw, or sketch for anything. I don't think that matters. Um, 
here's how I would tackle this, because I'm going to be honest, it sounds like you are able to get your hands dirty with some pretty serious code if you're like just putting Java together. together. Um, but if you have, I don't know, the capabilities to use HTML, just really, I, what I would recommend is to go on CodePen and start really diving into what's going on in CSS in terms of transitions. Because if you have a lot of programming chops and can understand it, you can easily make good-looking UIs if you're worried about do they look good enough. Um, but one important point that I really see that keeps coming up that I totally agree with, whether it's in articles, podcasts, whatever, there's a giant focus on this ability to make things beautiful. And that's cool. It's great. People love aesthetically pleasing things. But there is a completely different side that's especially important for being a UX designer and that's, is it functional and does it let people do the things they need to do? If you really want to jump into UX design, I would worry about more of the methodology and how you can ensure a great user experience versus worrying too much about you not having artistic capabilities. Because like I said, there's lots of powerful programs out there like Sketch, Photoshop, and my personal opinion is that web tools, the web tool stack of just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript is a great way to start building UIs um, or even using front end frameworks like Bootstrap. I mean, you can make really great looking things with low amounts of effort and make sure that they're functional. Um, and for your last point, if you have a really cool look for an app screen, do it, make it, make it either as a sketch mockup or a or use whatever mock-up software you like, try coding in an HTML and CSS and see where you get, and then show it to people. Let them use it. Let them kind of tear it apart or love it, hate it, whatever. Um, I don't know. Biggest point is it doesn't matter that you can't draw. You don't have to be artistic. It's process, and I think you've got a lot of awesome tools at your disposal that you just haven't used in a particular way yet. Yeah, so I will say one thing. Uh copying in academia is plagiarism copying in industry is iteration <laughs> i mean i i say that jokingly but honestly if you see something that's working for somebody else some other company take it and then iterate upon it and and take those ideas and see what's good about them and what's not good about them and Oftentimes, as a coder, you know that there is code behind it, and so if you can take that and make it just that much better, go for the incremental gains rather than the big, sweeping, novel ideas. At least that's that's the perspective that I go, because someone made this thing to begin with, and it works, and we know it works, so how can we make it better? That's kind of the approach that I take. Uh, also, if this is any sort of consolation i can't draw or sketch or paint or shit either so but i i'm still like blake said i'm my job responsibility is trying to figure out the workflow of things and, and trying to uh better understand the user and make sure it's functional and efficient for the user to use and not necessarily so pretty so that's that's just my two cents most definitely. And the last thing I would kind of just toss in there, I mean, you as a programmer, part of just being a developer is looking at other people's code, right? Well, if you, re if you really are dying to get your, your mock-up skills to look better, you want to make better looking logos, do what Nick said. Get on Dribbble and if you see some kind of app screen you really like, try and remake it. Do, do the best that you can to remake that. It, you'll learn more in that process and maybe even improve upon the design you've seen based on trying to work through it. I agree. Okay, should we let's get into the second one here. So this one is from the user experience subreddit again from Discount Vodka. <laughs> and they write <laughs> Do you even I did not see that name when I put it in here? <laughs> I was wondering if you even looked at the names when you pull these. Uh so this one is just got hired as a UX UI designer developer at a software development company. What can I expect and how do I better understand working alongside experienced developers? I'm, in, I'm currently lacking in the back-end development side of things, but I'm eager to better understand web, dev, uh, web developers slash engineers, workflows, and lingo. I hear a lot of talk about Angular, Java, C, Sharp, etc. What is a good starting point? Is it silly for me to take time to learn these languages? I'm proficient in HTML, CSS, and Foundation, but not much else. Uh, I'm going to take the lead on this one, Blake, and uh, then I'll toss it back to you. So... 
for this one, I would say communication is absolutely key when you're talking with developers and engineers because you can say one thing, and I think we talked about this last week on the show or maybe one of our bonus podcasts. I don't know. Uh, but honestly, it's all about speaking the same language because you can say one thing. Yeah, I did talk about this last week when we were we were talking about the collaboration piece from uh, Nancy Cook's speech. Yes, linking it back. Call back, said people. All right, so yeah, you want to make sure you're on the same page with things. You don't want to say something that they are going to misinterpret and then code up something that is totally not what you found or intended as a UX UI designer. And so learn the language as much as you need to in order to communicate those things. And yes, it will take time in order to get to that point where you guys can communicate effectively, but they need to meet you halfway. They need to be able to say, look, we can't do what you're asking of us because it's just not possible in the program. And the better you understand what's possible in these programs, the better you can kind of maneuver your recommendations to reflect what the possibilities are. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with Nick. Um, I kind of take a, a, I take a similar approach, and I think it's because I'm a little bit biased. So here's to you, Discount Vodka. I really, I really, really, really got to get excited about developing. Um, I have a human factors background like Nick does, and I really like doing UI design, working with users to really hammer out a good experience for them, but I want to make it uh, at the same time. So trying to understand what's going on in the back end as well as definitely what's happening on my front end code is really important to me. And so that's why I've taken a lot of the time to learn it, to really try and understand it from React to JavaScript, to HTML and CSS. But here's what, what I would say to you. If you hear a lot of talk about these languages, I what I found was helpful for me was asking developers directly, like, okay, what are you developing in so I can have a better understanding of what we're what we're talking about so that we're on the same page and that we can communicate effectively. And this works sometimes and sometimes it doesn't, but often you'll be met with a lot more respect that you want to understand the technology better so that you can make better recommendations. So from this perspective, I would figure that out and really go on Code Academy and check out maybe the Angular section. They've got like two little five-hour courses or whatever they have. Um, as far as really learning the languages, I don't know that you need to know the ins and outs of it unless you really think that that's something you're interested in and want to do. Because what I've learned in the past like six months really diving into front end and full stack development is the technology changes and it changes so rapidly even within the same technology. Um, in a matter of months, you'll have an entirely new way of doing things that are just going to change the entire landscape. So I think for you and what you're asking, I would get a really good high level understanding and just like Nick said, really have that open communication with your engineers to understand better what the back end is capable of. I think you nailed it. You hit it out of the park, Blake. You ready to take it home? Yes, let's go. All right, let's get out of here. That's it for today, everyone. Let us know what you think of our stories this week. Blake picked them, so blame him. Did you like them? Did you <laughs> <laughs> Let us know. You can hang out with us on our Slack and let us know there. Uh, if you guys have any suggestions for topics or news stories you want us to cover, you can head on over to all of our social media. Uh, that's LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. You can, like I said, join us on Slack. Our link can be found in the show notes. Uh, and the link can also be found on our SoundCloud. Check that out. You can leave us a comment over there or send us an email over at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. Uh, if you if you want it to be private, I guess. If you don't want it to be private and want everyone to know, leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. If we like what you say, we'll play it on the show. You can also support us on our Patreon site at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Be sure to like, subscribe, and review us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. We always like hearing those reviews and seeing how we're doing and iterating because that's how we do in Human Factors. And of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Mr. Blake Arnsdorf, thank you for doing all the stuff last week. And thank you for hanging out today and picking the stories. Where can our listeners find you if they want to talk about cochlear implants? Oh, yes. All right, guys and gals, you know where to find me. You can find me on Twitter at Don't Panic UX. Please hit me up. Let me know what you thought of the stories. Did you like them? Did you hate them? Did they think they were irrelevant? 
And if you ever have any questions or just want to banter about whatever in UX or what's going on in your life, again, hit me up on Twitter at Don't Panic UX. Excellent. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again, guys, for tuning in to Human Factors Cast this week. Until next time, it, it depends. depends. We hear Human Factors Cast in a cochlear implant? Uh, sure. Yeah. The most pure sound. You're listening to Human Factors Cast via your cochlear implant.